Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. So in this video, uh, we're going to look at pure memory. And uh, in this video and the next video, actually, this video is probably going to be a little bit shorter. Um, actually, that's my, my, my goal for these videos in a perfect world would be around 40 minutes. But they've just been creeping up and there's not like there's not enough material to do two videos but um, when I try and kind of fit it all into one it always seems to come out around just under an hour which is a little bit longer than I wanted but um, it's just the way the material seems to fall um, so this one's going to be a little bit shorter the next video I think will be a bit longer but um, that's cool so let's jump into pure memory Right, so first of all, I just want to kind of um, lay some, lay out some of the groundwork a little bit from just just get rid of some um, preliminaries uh, before we get into it. So in the the last video, you remember this diagram where we see um, pure memory, memory images, and perception, and the way that associationism only sees a difference of degree between these two, between sensation, perception, and memory. Um, but the, the important point that Bergson wants us to take away from this is that even though they are one thing, in the sense that they come, the, the, that whole line is one undivided thing. We can't, um, <clears throat> we can't break it up into, into into separate independent components, which are kind of t tacked onto each other. So they're a united whole, they're, they're a, a package deal. They come together always. We never have pure memory without the um, an associated perception, without kind of um, descent into the actual. And we never have pure perception, which which is, is not... Um, infused with memories so even though they come together they are still separate for Bergson they are two different things and as he says we can't find the past in the present the past is virtual the present is actual so there is no past um, in the present we can't put those things we um we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that they are two, two, two kind of ends of the same continuum, two end, different extreme ends of a spectrum. They're separate things. And he says, to picture is not to remember. And to picture, depends how you interpret that word, picture meaning to, um, to perceive is not to remember. Um, okay, so the past and the present are absolutely different. This is a quote that I wanted to give you for this. But there is much more between past and present than a mere difference of degree. My present is that which interests me, which lives for me, and in a word, that which summons me to action. Whereas my past is essentially powerless. So that's a, the reason I wanted to, to throw that up is that it's just got some good... Um, this, it really is kind of at the core of Bergson's philosophy, this notion that um, it catches a couple of things, right? The, my present is that which interests me, it lives for me, and I like that which summons me to action. So catching that notion that, again, what's central in Bergson is action, concrete action. That That's our fundamental um mode of engagement you might want to say with the world we're not detached um, observers uh, kind of or we're not speculative consciousnesses removed from reality we, we are thrust into the middle of it called to action by things around us summoned to action <clears throat> and the past is essentially powerless it's virtual and it, it gets its actuality only from that connection to the present, which we um, <clears throat> which we see in, in that di that diagram I just showed you, that continuum from pure memory to pure perception, and uh, and we we also saw in the that earlier diagram with the the way that 
pure memory and perception kind of um, overlap when it comes to perceiving objects. So cool. Um, so that's the first thing to note, just a, um, reiterating that point, past and the present are absolutely different. And the other thing I wanted to mention here is, um, is kind of a prelude, prelude, it's kind of a, um, setting the, this, the background for this, for pure memory, is um, what Bergson has to say about the the uh, the dualism between matter and spirit, and and by spirit I think Bergson is is really referencing or has in mind perhaps Descartes mind, so that difference between extended and unextended matter and mind, um, and we'll we'll pick this up in a couple of videos. Actually, we'll look more at the at um, Bergson's dualism because he is a dualist. He does he does hold to a dualist framework, but it's it's quite different from Descartes' dualism. Um, but we won't get into that just now. But in terms of setting us up for pure memory, he he looks at materialism, which holds that uh, consciousness is a function of the interplay of material elements. So qualities, quali qualities that we perceive in the world are nothing more than the word he uses as phosphorescences following cerebral phenomena. That's quite nice, quite a nice way to put it. I think it's basically epiphenomenalism. So the idea that your mental um, states just arise in some way, right? They emerge from the activity of your brain. That's what materialism says. So everything's purely material. The, the mental images are just, just the, these phosphorescences. Spiritualism, so kind of the other half of that dualism. Uh, oh, and so, sorry, what, what materialism, the, the, uh, what the effect that has, what consequence that has for us is that it, it removes qualities from matter because we, we've got this big divide. Right, between matter and the phosphorescences, the um, consciousness, the mental mental um, states. So because we've got that divide um, and, and mental states are just the activity of our brain, we don't we, we don't really know what the world is like, what things are really like out there. The qualities that we perceive are just, Follow, just follow from the activities of our brains, from the activity of our brains. Uh, they may or may not map onto matter out there, the actual matter. We don't know, right? And the same thing with spiritualism. Spiritualism also removes qualities from matter. So if we take the opposite tack, where um, it's mind that is doing that is that is active in this in this relationship, then Again, all the qualities are, are being produced by the mind, in the mind, and we have no way of, again, knowing whether um, what we perceive, the qualities that we, we apprehend, whether they are actually out there in the things themselves. So it's a very divided position. It's a very divided um, way of thinking. You've got matter on one side, spirit on the other, and uh, and this is the biggest problem with with Descartes, that or it's the the biggest epistemological problem that there's no way to bridge that divide. You never know if your mental representations map onto reality, and whether you take the position that matter is is fundamental or that mind is fundamental, that same problem arises in both. Qualities don't belong in, they don't come from matter itself. We can't place them in the things themselves. All we can say is, that's what I perceive. Whether that's true or not, we have absolutely no idea. So both then 
reduce matter to something mysterious, something that we, we, we can say absolutely nothing about with certainty. And that's really Kant's position, right? The thing in itself. We have, we have no way of knowing what it's like out there. We can't say anything about it. All we know are the representations that, that we generate or that are generated by our brains. Um, so Bergson wants to, to he, like I said, he, has a, he is dualist himself. Did I say that? He is dualist, but he wants, his, his dualism wants to, or with his dualism, he will try to overcome that, that barrier. So he says the only way to refute materialism is to show matter is just as it appears. And we've kind of done that. When we, when we identified, when we, when we talked about perception, pure perception, it's just matter. It's just, we, we are just seeing the thing out there because there is nothing else. There is, the brain is not producing any unextended images. All we're seeing is what's there. It is, however, diminished. We talked about that. It's diminished by our goals and our, our experiences and our background and our part and, you know, our context, all of those things diminish the object, so we only see a part of it, but we're not creating anything that's not there. Um, so perception is in matter, and this then clears the way for us to see spirit as an independent reality, and not spirit as, um, we shouldn't start thinking about, uh, like, like a kind of ghostly thing or a soul-like you know, religious notion. That is definitely not where Bergson's going with this. But like I said, he, 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 does, he is dualistic, and we'll talk more about what he means by spirit later. But that lets us, it kind of paves the way for us to get to an, a proper understanding of how matter and spirit are related, um, even though they they are kind of intertwined in this way. The biggest, and this is the biggest obstacle, the fact that, that they are so closely intertwined, is that memory, through a twofold operation, which I talked about before, importing the past into the present, that's what memory does, right? keeps the past alive, lets, lets the past come into the present, and it con contracts many moments of duration into a single intuition. So the, the, that double movement, twofold operation, importing the past into the present, contracting many moments of duration, many of those successive events or successive um, experiences, contracting them into one intuition. That um, means that memory becomes lost in perception. It's, it becomes inextricably bound up with it in our, when, when we reflect on it, when we think about what it is. And so we end up placing um, memory, with, or we think memory is a part of perception, and perception is a part of memory. Those two things are just kind of two halves of the same coin. They are a difference of degree. When actually, Bergson wants to make the point, and it's the point I started with, memory and perception, past and present, are absolutely different things, which are nevertheless, all, they always appear together. Um, and that is where I'm going to pivot into pure memory, because if spirit is real, if, spirit, if Bergson's right in his dualism that there is something different to there are there are two elements here if spirit's real we come into contact with it in memory so that's the importance of memory for Bergson and uh, and we'll see exactly like I said we'll talk more about spirit in a couple of videos later but um, but those two ideas are, are very closely intertwined spirit and memory um, and so, with that said, let's have a look at 
the three features of pure memory. So this section actually is, is quite short. Um, I, I, I don't, for some reason, there isn't much to say about pure memory. The next video will talk um, more about pure memory and its, uh, its relation to habit memory. <clears throat> but pure memory itself, we can, we can quickly knock off. So I've got three features which kind of describe or, or characterize pure memory. First, it lacks sensation. So sensation is bound up with, with um, perception. So it's, it's in the present. It's that sensory motor um, activity. So it's, it's, it's essentially present, which means pure memory is completely different, right? It's past. So pure memory lacks sensation. Sensation is always present. Pure memory lacks sensation. Uh, this, and these three fe features are actually all pretty pretty similar. This means that um, pure memory has no attachment to the present. Right? So there's no, there's no um, gradation, there's no steady movement from pure memory kind of down a, um, a slope easing into perception. It doesn't become perception. It doesn't become present, I should say. There's a, there's a, a fundamental change um, when we get to perception, when we get to the present from pure memory. Again, even though we can't pinpoint that moment, there isn't a, there isn't a specific moment. Remember that diagram from the beginning, there isn't, we can't say, okay, this is pure memory, bang, here it changes, now it's, pre now it's the present. There is no moment like that. Um, and yet, and that's just because th th this whole process is, is fundamentally ambiguous. Bergson doesn't use that word, but um, uh, that, that's more Merleau-Pontian Merleau term, but, um, but, but that's what it is. That, that's the idea. There is no clear distinction. We can't, uh, that's uh, Bergson's whole whole thing right with psychic states they're not clear we can't say you know this this is your love We're talking about love this is your love here this is your jealousy it's exactly this big and it's 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 pushing in it's it's over overlapping your your love like this and and you've got your passion over here and that's doing this and none of this is that that's speaking about these things as if they're quantitative as if we can put numbers on them fit them into boxes and, and, you know, clear and distinct. That's not the way that um, humans are. That's not the way that our experiences, that's not the way our mental states interact. And this, this, it just doesn't capture human experience. And that's because fundamentally we're coming back to this notion of duration, right? Where everything is, is a continuous flow. Everything is... is continually changing and evolving and, and, and moving There's, it's dynamic nothing is ever fixed um, so I've gone way off track there um, so it has no attachment pure memory has no attachment to the present cool and pure memory is also therefore unextended but not an unextended representation, right? We're not talking about um, mental representations. It's not something, it's not an unextended um, phenomenon uh, produced by my brain or anything. We're not talking about those unextended mental representations. It's unextended because it's time, because it's temporal, it's duration. So it does, it's not extended, it's not in space, but not because it's something, you know, produced, but it's, some, it's an emergent phenomenon. It's something intangible that's conjured up by the, the brain in some way. It's unextended because it's fundamentally time, memory, the past. That's what we're talking about. So the diagram for the, uh, to explain this looks like this. And um, what this 
what the, what this means the uh, the kind of deciphering this diagram the line there along the bottom the horizontal line a to b this is space so this is your extended um, perceptions I guess your ex or your uh, spatial awareness um, a to b going both directions and CI, the vertical line, is time moving in one direction, right? So space goes both directions, A and B goes, extends out in all directions. CI, the, the, t the temporal line, only moves in one direction from the past to the future. Um, and so the time, the vertical line only goes to I, it stops at I because the future hasn't happened yet something which is is um, continually being created in you or being created I should say so we can't represent that yet until it's happened um, so okay so we've got space and time now what well, what we have with this diagram what this diagram shows is that we recognize unperceived objects in space and we have no problem with that, but deny the same objects, unperceived objects, in time, i.e. past objects. So we only, we, we, um, we privilege the present as being real. In the past, those unperceived objects, um, we, we, we relegate to fantasy or illusion or subjective, just, just in your mind, not real. Yet with extended objects, even though I'm not perceiving them now, maybe you know the, the things outside my room now, I'm not perceiving them, they're in space, but we have no problem acknowledging that they're real, even though I'm not perceiving them now. That's what this, the idea with this diagram, we, we have this imbalance Unperceived objects in space are real, but unperceived objects in time, i.e. the past, we think are illusory. Why? Why do we have this um, in in inequality with time and space? The reason is because the former objects in space are useful. They bear on action. And even unperceived objects, so obviously things around me now that I perceive in space, they're immediately useful to me. They, they, they summon me to action. But th even things unperceived, we know that once I, once I leave this room, the objects outside here will, be, will, will um, have practical value for me. They will be things that I will, I will need to use or want to use. So because they have that direct kind of connection to our, um, to our, our practical activity, we see them as being real. But, the, but uh, objects in time, unperceived objects in time, having already been perceived and now unchangeable, right now powerless was that word we used in the, that quote at the beginning, they, now they lack that usefulness for us they no longer they no longer um, call us to action they no longer summon us to do something they're, they're just powerless that's what the past is for us it, it, it no longer has the, the um, capacity to motivate me in the same way that present objects do Sartre makes a good he talks about that a lot, right, and, and being in nothingness. Um, but the point for us here is that this concerns practical utility. So it's fine as a practical um, way of understanding the world, and that's the way we, we uh, originally interact. That's, that's the way that we, we can't help but interact in this way. We are, we're, we're naturally, first and foremost, um, creatures of action. Right? We, we 
we do things in the world. So that's that's fine as far as as far as practical utility goes. But this is not a valid metaphysical distinction. So when we want to understand reality itself, what what's really happening? This bias for the present. Um, and for practical utility is is now a hindrance. Now it doesn't help us because we we want to get beyond that to see what 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 the world is like um, without reference to our practical utility, without reference to our, to immediate action. Um, and so that's why we we have this bias for the present and. Um, but it's also why we sh we should try and overcome it, because what we're doing here is trying to understand um, reality itself. Right? We're not trying to understand reality through the eyes of a an engaged being using objects that, that desires to do certain things. Another reason uh, why we have this bias is that objects in space appear fixed and coherently ordered. There's a there's a um, <clears throat> there's a logic to things in space, you know. The thing that that thing over there is on the left, that thing over there is on the right, and there's another thing. We, everything kind of holds to their positions as well, right? We don't we don't jump from that thing to see that thing next, and then to see this thing in the middle. That's not how they they appear to us. We can, of course, do that, but we're aware that we're jumping around in what, what is really a fixed landscape, an extended scene before us. However, memories, the order in which my memories appear to me, he says, is capricious, which is nice. So there's no, there's no fixed order. We don't have that sense of everything being laid before us and we are the ones jumping around. It's more like memories just come at us from everywhere, right? I might get something may trigger a memory from 10 years ago, and that'll trigger a memory from yesterday. That'll trigger something else. So memories are just always coming at us seemingly without rhyme or reason. There is a connection, but, but there's no logical kind of coherence to them. They're just or not, not random, but very... Um, but there, there, there's just no solid pattern. There's no logic to um, to their layout, to the way they exist, which makes it seem as if they are just not real, right? It, it, it lends this air of of um, illusion to them. It makes us feel like they're not they're not things that are real. Not like things in space, which which do hold to their positions, which are fixed where they are. Um, and so this gives, let me just read what I've got. This gives the uh, objects in space the appearance of a chain which extends out even to those objects that I don't perceive. So that, that, that coherence kind of extends from what I perceive now to things that I don't perceive. And we don't get that in, in memories. However, what Bergson wants us to, to understand is that memories form a chain of the same kind and our character, always present in all our decisions, is indeed the actual synthesis of all our past states. In this epitomized form, our previous psychical life exists for us even more than the external world, of which we never perceive more than a very small part, whereas on the contrary, we use the whole of our lived experience. Nice. So we usually don't. We usually think of ex things extended in space as as this kind of chain, as a, a solid, complete chain, um, and memories as kind of attacking us from all different directions. There's no logic to them, no coherence, but there is a coherence to them. We're just not aware of it. We just tend to not be aware of it in our daily muse, in our daily thoughts about it, right? When we reflect on it, it seems as if memory is just this diffuse, unreal thing. When actually there is a clear chain 
And in fact, all of those memories are always bearing on us. They're always in, they're always, um, in a sense perceived, not, not, um, explicitly so, but they're perceived in our character. Everything that, that we've done and experienced is, is a part of who we are now. It's, it's, uh, it's not perceived explicitly as kind of in the same way that we perceive objects, but it's, it's brought to bear in our lives through who we are, through our characters. Uh, which, which means, Bergson's saying here, um, our psychical, our previous psychical life, our past, our memories exist even more for us. They're even more real than um, external states, uh, external um, objects, perceptions, which which may not even be, you know, we only see ever a small sliver of um, extended reality, whereas we carry our the entire in the entirety of our pasts in our bodies, in our characters, in the way that we, the way that we engage with the world, the way that we. The, the way that we carry ourselves, our past is with us. Um, it, our past is infused into our very beings. Um, so it's always there, more real than, than extended objects. So that's the thing. That's, that's the take-home point. Time is just as real as space, if not more so. For Bergson, it's even, it's even realer. It's even more real. That's, brings us back to duration, which, which underlies everything in, in Bergson's metaphysics. Um, what else did I want to say about that quote? Since there are non-perceived material objects in space, unconscious states, objects outside of my consciousness, uh, my present consciousness, objects in the past, they also exist. Cool. Cool. And, uh, and this is interesting too. It's then, it's therefore meaningless to ask, and this, because this is the question you would want to ask, where are the memories though? Where are they? Bergson says they're not in the brain. So where are they? They have to be stored somewhere, right? I mean, that, that just stands to reason, doesn't it? But that is exactly spatial thinking. That's thinking in terms of extended um, it's thinking in extend in terms of extension, right? When memory, time, past is precisely not extended. So there's just that the, that question. It seems like it makes sense, but where are the memories? If they're not in the brain, they must be stored somewhere. But it doesn't make any sense. It's like it's like asking. Um, what shape is justice? It just it doesn't apply. Justice doesn't have a shape. Time doesn't have a place, right? Memories are past. Memories are the past. So there, there's just no way to. And we we really have to kind of get over that thinking that that um, memories must exist somewhere. That that's just a kind of a holdover of this this natural spatial way of thinking that we all have that, that again it's natural this is not something bad it's it, it's what we have to it's how we have to think in order to live in order to function but um, when we want to understand reality when we want to understand the truth of things metaphysical nature of things we have to look beyond that we have to we have to dig a bit deeper, and um, and when we do that, we see that this this question is completely meaningless. Where are memories? Where is time? That's what you're asking. Where is the past? It doesn't make any sense. The past is just that time is just as real as the present, and if time is sorry, time is just as real as space, and if time is just as real as space, which is what Bergson's arguing throughout everything, right? The importance of duration. Uh, not reducing duration to just another temporal dimension, not reducing time to just another temporal dimension, then, then 
where are memories is they're in the past. They're, they're, they're in time. They're in that temporal dimension. Um, and it only sounds like um, kind of nonsense to say that. It sounds like it's nonsense because we, we privilege space so much because we think naturally in terms of space so when you say it's in time you think time's not real what what do you mean it's in time time's just in your mind right things can't be in time but that's precisely what it is to think spatially and that's what Bergson's asking us to get beyond and this brings me to the final section of today's video um, where I want to look at existence, what this means. So we've been talking uh, a lot about, well, I've been talking a lot about time existing in the same way that space does, or at least in the same way that space does. And that, that, it's good to kind of flesh out here what, what do we mean by existence? What does it mean to say that something exists? And uh, Bergson gives us two conditions which are necessary if something is to exist. First, it must um, appear in consciousness. There must be presentation in consciousness. And second, there must be a logical or a causal connection with other events or states. So both of these are necessary in order for something to exist. But, and this is the key point, they may be fulfilled unequally. So they're not necessarily both um, realized to the same degree. But they're both present in anything that exists. And so what we see then is that, um, let's say, okay, let's take the second one first logical or causal connection with other events or states, that is perfectly fulfilled in external objects, objects extended in space. Uh, but it's, it's, it's imperfect, it's only imperfectly true, um, it's only imperfectly presented to consciousness. So we don't, we never have that, that kind of clear, crystal clear um, sense of the the object out there in space. Why? Because the object always hides most of itself from us, right? It's always diminished in some way. So we never have our, our um, perception of objects is never complete. They never completely present themselves to us. They're always um, diminished by the sometimes by just the, just the angle that we're we're looking at the thing right if I'm looking at at the thing from this direction I can't see its rear side but I know it's there but um, but it's it's not present for me now if I'm looking for something to write with and I glance around I won't see anything except things that might be tools to write with um, so everything it, it, so things are never fully present before us. They never bear before us, um, before before our consciousnesses, before our minds. So we have that, they, they external objects satisfy the second condition, um, logical or causal connections with other things, but they only imperfectly satisfy the first, presentation and consciousness. And internal psychic states are the opposite though. They're perfectly presented in consciousness that's the, that's where they that's the only place where they really are right they only appear for us in consciousness they're completely there there's nowhere else nothing's hidden from us but that logical or causal connection is only loosely adhered to as we, we talked about before they they seem to be almost random right the, the order in which i recall my past is Nothing, nothing, nothing is is fixed. Right? I can I can see the past in any order I like, and it's not. It's it's like a, a diffuse mass of stuff out there, which is just which I'm 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 calling forth. It's not not clear and fixed and and 
um, laid out in the same way that things are in space. So those are those are how those two internal psychic states and external objects, um, how they both exist, but they exist in that different way with that different emphasis. And our intellect, which likes clean cut distinctions only recognizes the main element in each. So our intellects like things with nice, clear boundaries. They, we want to apportion things exactly. We want to delineate where things are, where they start and where they finish. And we want a nice, clean picture, right? That, that's how the intellect works. So they, instead of seeing this, the, um, the mix here, it only treats it only it only considers the main element of each so the existence of psychic states the past is assumed to consist in apprehension by consciousness only that is to say purely subjective that is to say not real something just it's just in your mind it doesn't exist in reality and the existence of external objects, the intellect holds as um, only being because of that logical or causal connection. It only, it only um, consists in that logical causal connection, which is out there, which is, is there before us. So it's, it's real. Logical, causal order, nice, clean, organized distinctions, that's real. That that's as solid and and um, yeah, it's, it's it's kind of an unchanging reality. We can move things about, obviously, but but there's still that that fixed background, that spatial layout framework in which things make sense, in which things are form a coherent um, picture, and so that then becomes purely objective i.e. real. But this way of thinking also leads us into a dualism which can't be bridged, into, into which these things are completely independent. I think that, that's the best word here. They are, they're not just separate, but they're independent realities. You've got your psychic states over here, your mind, that's spiritualism, and you've got your extended objects over here matter that's materialism and uh, again for Bergson there is a dual dualism as well the two things are different but they are connected in a, in a tighter fashion that they're not independent they're dependent they, they have a, a close connection on each other to each other so that might be a good way to think about it actually the uh, for Bergson those things pure memory and perception past and present are separate but not independent whereas for for um, Descartes they're separate and independent and there's no there's no way of crossing that bridge once you set up um, the two sides of the dualism in this way but we'll look at that a couple of videos later right summary so pure memory first, um, the past and present are absolutely different. That's that's important. That that expression there to picture is not to remember. So presentations, um, sorry, perception is to perceive is not to remember. Is basically the idea there. Two different things. The three features of pure memory I wanted to emphasize: they pure memory lacks sensation. It has no attachment to the present and is unextended. And since um, memory is time, it means that pure memory is literally nowhere. It doesn't exist in some place. Because for that to, have, for that to be true, time would have to be space. Um, and so despite all of those three features, time is nevertheless real. P 
pure, pure memory is nevertheless real because it's time and time is real, duration. Then we looked at existence um, and we saw there are two conditions for existence which are both necessary but they are unequally fulfilled. The first condition was presentation and consciousness and the second was a, having a logical or causal connection with other events or and states and or states. And we saw there that um, psychic states are um, predominantly presented to consciousness. The causal connections are, are only loose or weak and um, extended objects in space um, are mainly comprised of um, the second logical or causal connections with their presentation and consciousness being only um, being less less clear less uh, being weaker thing but since intellect only sees the main element in each we end up thinking that objects in space are real they're objective they are they have that that coherence which which makes them appear real for us Whereas the past, as time, as something which doesn't seem to have such a strong logical or causal connection um, between the different elements, between different memories, ends up becoming something illusory for us. Okay, cool. So that is pure memory. Uh, in the next video, we will we'll finish up pure memory by looking at its relation to habit memory in the same way that we looked at pure memory and its relation with perception we're going to um, that was kind of the video before this now we've just looked at what pure memory is kind of cashed it out in terms of time so linking it with duration making it real that's that's the main point here i think pure memory is real time is real if we if we hold to that then um, that that's the way we kind of get over this um, imbalance in the way that we think about memory and the past and um, the present and, and objects in the present. And then in the next video, we'll look at, like I say, uh, pure memory and its connection to habit memory. I think I've said that too many times. Let me stop here before I repeat myself anymore. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you shortly.